Uh, welcome everybody. Good morning. Um, cameras on, please. Um, so we are still talking about allocations of uh, tax items. So the partnership realizes tax items and allocates them to the partners. And uh, we test those allocations for substantial economic effect. If the allocations have substantial economic effect, then they're valid. If not, then we have to, in general, reallocate in accordance with the partner's interest in the partnership, the old PIP standard. And um, again, just stepping back from things, we have the economic effect, which we've gone over, we'll do a review uh, in a little bit. Um, and then we're focusing on substantiality, which is focused on the possibility of offsetting allocations and the fact that clever tax lawyers could try to game the system by basically offsetting uh, allocations to exploit the partner's tax attributes. And um, uh, that's the game that we're trying to tease out, um, trying to distinguish between tax-driven allocations and allocations that are uh, economic, have economic effect, have a real economic, pre-tax economic reality. It's a really tough challenge to do because we can't uh, hook them up to a lie detector and say, are your allocations tax motivated? And they can be tax motivated to some extent, they just can't be too tax motivated. So that's what these tests are designed to do. We talked about shifting and transitory, which are close cousins. Both of those tests are comparing to a baseline. All of these tests are comparing to a baseline allocation scheme with the allocation scheme in question. And for shifting and transitory, we have two sort of focuses, foci, I think, focusi, fo foci? Two uh, things we look at, the capital accounts, uh, are the capital accounts pretty much the same under the baseline as with the special allocations? And if so, then we ask, does the total tax liability of the partners go down? We're going to add up the tax liability of the partners and see if it goes down. And if both of those are yes, then the allocations lack substantial economic effect. Um, and that, that's really the two, um, those two tests. And the difference between the two tests is that shifting is looking at one taxable year in isolation and transitory is widening the scope and looking at multiple years to find the offsetting allocations. And we did examples there. Any questions on any of that thus far? It's a good time for me to stop, answer any questions. It's tough stuff. Don't be shy. Don't be shy throughout. If you have a question, you can use the chat function, raise hand function, just blurt out your question. Okay. Um, so then we talked about the overall tax effects test or the after tax test however you want to call it, which is our last test. And that's really asking the question is, what's the likelihood that someone, some partner could be substantially hurt by the special allocations compared to the baseline? Uh, in a sense, when you move from the baseline to another allocation scheme, it's a bet. They're betting, the partners are betting on something happening. Um, and the question is, could somebody really lose from that bet? And if it's rigged in a way, that no one could really lose, that's the problem under the after-tax effects test. After-tax effects test, yeah. Um, and we'll, we'll see how that works. Again, in, in the abstract, that's really hard to understand. This is why example five is so useful to understand what, what we're getting at there. Let me just put a finer point on the allocations problem. Um, and let's take a look at a code section we haven't looked at yet, which is 761. Uh, C. So let's turn to section 761C of the code right now. So it's this definition of partnership agreement. And we know under 704A that, you know, an important analysis here is the allocations go where the partnership agreement says they go, except if it lacks substantial economic effect. 
So we start with a partnership agreement. And so what about amending the partnership agreement? How flexible can you be to amend the partnership agreement? And it turns that subject K is very flexible. It gives a lot of flexibility because it, it defines partnership agreement to mean to include any modification, any amendment of the partnership agreement made prior to or at the time prescribed by law for the filing of the partnership tax return. So if you're a calendar year partnership taxpayer, calendar year partnership, which they all will be in this class, your taxable year ends on December 31. The partnership tax return is due on uh, March 15th. So this allows you to retroactively amend your partnership agreement after the year is over, all the way up to March 15th of the following year. So you can amend your year one partnership agreement as late as March 15, year two. And by amending the partnership agreement, you could amend the allocations. And this is done quite frequently it's, uh, in, a, in service partnerships, like a law firm partnership. A law firm partnership uh, will typically decide the partnership sort of compensation after the year is over. They'll have a usually a committee I'm talking about big law firms, a committee of partners that whose job it is to figure out how much each partner should earn. And they'll take into account things like how many hours you build, what clients you generated, et cetera, et cetera. And they'll do that after the close of the year, because only after the close of the year, they sort of know what's going on. And they'll say, oh, partner X, you had a really good return. We're going to allocate you a lot of income. And part of why we're going to do, we're going to allocate you just uh, less because you did less and so on. And so, and that's valid, that's allowed. Um, so these flexible allocations are, uh, this ability is, 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 is useful in that case, but it could also be used if we didn't have a rule like substantiality, it could also be used for abuse very easily. Um, because now once you know what the partnership has realized, you could just allocate that in a way that makes everybody better off. Hey, partner X over there, you got a bunch of capital loss carryovers. How about we we'll give you a bunch of capital gains? Partner Y, you're in a low rate, ta low taxable year situation. We'll give you a bunch of the ordinary income. Partner Z, you're in a high rate. We'll give you all the tax exempt income and we'll just play that game. And that's the most obvious situation. That's where the crystal ball that we have to use in with substantiality is really clear because we know when we have the partnership, when the special allocations become part of the partnership agreement, we actually know exactly what's happened. So in that case, all those, that plan wouldn't work. Now in the law firm partnership, these special allocations or these uh, retroactive allocations are going to be valid because the law firm partners, this is all ordinary income. The law firm partners, law firm partnership typically has just sort of one amount, one character of income, ordinary income. So what kind of games can you play with just ordinary income with all sort of high rate individuals? There's nothing, no game to play. So it's not a problem with part with um, in, the, in the law firm context um, because there's no, to put it into the substantiality test, number one, uh, there's no uh, there's no reduction in tax liability for shifting. Um, if you give more ordinary income to partner A, less to partner Y, uh, y um, there's no re reduction in, in income. Secondly, uh, on the, under the uh, after-tax effects test, uh, is uh, that partners are really harmed by this because if you are the partner that would have gotten, let's say, a 35% allocation, but because you um, had a bad year, you only get 25%, you know, you do have an after-tax loss. Another way to say this is the way retroactive allocations, the baseline is very clear. It's the old allocation scheme. It's the pre-amendment um, partnership agreement. When we have prospective allocations, we're out, we're changing the partnership agreement uh, in on December 31 of year zero to apply to year one, that's when the crystal ball becomes 
more fuzz and more blurry, right? We got to actually think, okay, what's going to happen in the future? Okay, any questions on any of this? Comments? Okay, let's um, go back to the after tax effects test. So this is in terms of Treasury Reg 1.704-1B2. So dash one B2, three little eyes, A. Dash one B2, three little eyes, A. So here's the after-tax effects test right here. I'm just gonna, I'm actually just gonna highlight the most important part of it, which is really prong two. So we have a problem under this test, if there's a strong likelihood that after-tax economic consequences of no partner will be substantially diminished compared to the baseline. So that's what we're looking for. Can a partner get hurt? Another way, again, if you view this sort of the special allocation as a bet, you're betting on something happening. If, can someone lose? Can one of the partners lose? That's what we're looking for. Okay, and then the reg example, as we talked about last class, we'll be toggling back forth here, but is uh, example five, dash one B five, example five here. And here we have high rate and low rate partners. I'll call them high and low instead of I and J. High is gonna be in a 50% bracket, low is gonna be in a 15% bracket. And they're gonna realize two types of, and they're, they're, they're equal before. So baseline jumps out at you, 50-50 is the baseline. And they're going to amend the partnership agreement to say, okay, let's allocate all of the taxable interest. It says dividends as well. Again, in the old days, dividends was, were just ordinary income. So let's just call it taxable interest is going to go to low, is going to go uh, exclusively to low rate. And the tax exempt interest is going to go disproportionately to high rate, 80% to high rate, 20% to low rate. And so one way to, and we're told this is our crystal ball, you know, that's the amendment in the agreement. The crystal ball is, well, how much tax exempt interest and taxable interest will be recognized in year, in year one, in the future? We have to predict, we have to estimate. The business people will do this, right? They'll have spreadsheets and they'll say, this is what we expect to happen. They'll have ranges of things that will happen. So allow the business people to make decisions. So here, the range that we're given is that there's gonna be recognized by the partnership between 450 and 550 of each type of income. And so what's really going on here, if you think about it, is that they each start out with a 50% share of these types of income. H is effectively selling his 50% share of the taxable income in exchange for an additional 30% share of the tax exempt, right? It's not, you know, it might be simpler if, you know, it's just a swap of 50 uh, and 50, but it's not. I and mean, uh, low rate is still going to have 20% of the tax exempt income. So that's the that's the bet. And so if you think about it, what high rate is betting on in a world without taxes, right? If there were no tax considerations, I is just making a bet that tax exempt income is going to be higher than taxable income. And low bracket is making the opposite bet. So how do we apply the after-tax effects test here? Well, one approach, and this is what the example does is, 
Well, knowing there's that bet, and we know we have to figure out what someone could be worse off, we could sort of jump right to the situation where they've sort of lost the bet the most. Um, I, sometimes I use a word, I'll say worst case allocation, worst case, um, worst case uh, situation. But it's not really the worst case. I mean, the worst case would be 450 and 450 of each. If you just sort of, you know, that's the lowest they could possibly. But we're trying to see what's the hot, what's the best situation where a partner could end up worse off by virtue of making this bet. And so for starting with, um, with low bracket taxpayer, um, low bracket taxpayer is most likely to lose because low bracket, again, is giving up a 30% uh, share of the tax exempt for an additional 50% of the taxable. Low brackets most likely to lose if the tax exempt is the highest possible amount and the taxable is the lowest, right? And so let's assess that possibility and see under that situation is low bracket worse off. Okay, any questions thus far about what we're gonna do? We could, we could analyze every single permutation and do this. That would take a lot of time, but it's really unnecessary because if we can jump to the sort of, again, the worst case scenario in terms of the uh, low bracket losing, this is it. And so if a low bracket doesn't lose here, low bracket won't lose under any permutation. So here, again, we have our baseline. And we have our, we can call it with the special allocations. We've got our high and low. And again, the, the thing we're testing is gonna be um, the most of, um, I wanna do actually, to flip that around, I wanna do low for uh, high first. So the worst case for high is gonna be, again, the most tax exempt income and the no, the worst case for low yes is the most uh, tax exempt which would be 550 the highest possible tax exempt because he's getting rid of 30 percent of that we'll see why i do it this way in a second and of the taxable there's the least of that, because that's what he's getting more of. So you're getting 225. So the most tax exempt possible, the least taxable possible, under the baseline, they just share it 50-50. Again, we're focusing here on low. With the special allocations, what we're gonna do is we're gonna give 80% of the taxable, 80% times 550, we give that to high and to low, we give 20%. And then low gets all of the taxable. So under the baseline, their capital accounts would each go up by 500. With the special allocations, H's capital account goes up by 440 and L's goes up by 560. So one quick aside, the shifting test is probably not going to attack this because the capital accounts are pretty different. Um, 500 to 440 and 500 to 560, there's real variability in the capital account. And that's what, you know, this overall tax effects or after tax effects test is designed to to, to, tap, to deal with is those situations where you, you can manipulate the capital accounts and have them have real differences and still have these tax motivated allocations. 
but let's test this. We're actually getting, I'm going to say, oh, um, is there a, uh, what could a partner get be worse off? And again, since we're focusing on L, it's most likely to, it's going to be worse off here. If, if L is going to be worse off, this is going to be the case. This is going to be the permutation where L is. So what are the, the after-tax economic results? So we can just add the tax, the after-tax amount. Well, there's 275. This is after tax. That's tax exempt. So we don't have to adjust that. And this 225 is subject to tax. So we're going to have to multiply that by 85%. L is in a 15% bracket. So if L gets allocated 225 of taxable income at a 15% marginal tax rate, that's going to leave them 85% of it. So that adds to 191.25. That's this tax affected. This times 0.85 is 191.25. And that leaves L with 466.25 under the baseline, under this permutation. What about after? Well, again, we got 110. That doesn't have to be tax affected because that's tax exempt. We now have 450. Again, multiply that times 0.85. And that 0.85 of that is 382.50. And that is 492.50. And, and we compare this and we see Lo and behold, L can't lose. This is printing money for L if it works, because the least that L could lose, the least that L could lose is to win 26. Right? This is a lock dead win for L. L has no skin in the game. Again, if this were to work, L does this without any uh, any worry at all. If we run any other permutation, L is going to be better off, even better than 26 up. So L can't lose. And by the way, H could win. H is going to win big. Let's just do H real quick. H is a little simpler math because H is going to get 275 under the baseline. That's tax exempt. We don't have to tax affect that. And since H's bracket is 50%, H is going to get 112.50 after tax from this. So that's 387.50. And H here ends up with 440. Tax is out. We don't have to tax affect it. So H, this is H's maximum win is 52 and change. Okay. Any questions about this test for L? Okay. Now for, we now test H, so L can't lose, what about H? Could H lose? So let's do that. So for L, um, for H to lose, the situation where H is most likely to lose, because H is relinquishing a bunch of taxable for an extra amount of tax exempt, it would be where tax exempt is the lowest and the taxable is the highest. So tax exempt would be 450, which under the baseline would go 225 each. 
and taxable would be 275 uh, each, 550. With the special allocations, H gets 80% of the tax exempt, which is 360. L gets 20%, which is 90. And L gets all of the taxable. So again, this is even a more clear case where shifting is not gonna be, does not appear to be uh, the test that would, that would attack this. There's a really big range of capital accounts where H could, you know, starts out at 500 under the baseline, but would be all the way down to 360. Nevertheless, could this pass muster under the after-tax effects test? Again, you just fail one and you're, you're out of the safe harbor. So another way to say it is just because it passes shifting and it looks like it does because capital counts are so different. You know, there's, there's fuzziness in these tests because it talks about substantial, um, substantial difference or let me get the language. There's like strong likelihood and then they're substantially diminished and differ substantially. So does the partner capital accounts differ substantially? Uh, seems like it, but again, um, you know, in close cases, it would be hard to, you know, that you could fight over that. This seems pretty easy case. Um, just in percentage terms, you know, this capital account here is 28% less. H's capital account got, has gone down by 28%. And L's capital account's gone up by 28%. So um, anyway, what about the after-tax effects test? And again, we're going to now look at H and we're going to see, okay, how much cash after tax does H end up with in his pocket? Again, the tax exempt is easy. We don't have to tax affect it. The math is easier because he gets 50% after tax of this, which is 137.50. And that adds up to 362.50. And now over here, math is even simpler. He just walks away with 360. So actually H can lose, H can lose. So then it gets to the question of whether that's a substantial diminishment. And the right example just concludes it's not a substantial diminishment. It doesn't explain really why. Um, what that, how do you determine that? I mean, obviously we're talking like literally $2.50. That seems ridiculous, but, you know, add four zeros to this and it, you know, we're talking real money. Um, I won't test you on what's a substantial diminishment. Again, if this were to come up there, you could say um, it may be, it may not be, and give me the answer. Likely, I'll just wouldn't even come up because there's really no clear guidance what that means. One way to think about it is that remember, under the best case scenario for H, H would have won by what do we say, like $57 or? H would have won by, yeah, 52, 52. So H would have won about 52 under the reverse, in the inverse situation. Now he's losing 250. So again, uh, if this were, if it was just as likely that it would be 450 and 550 as it would be 550 and 450, then it's kind of like an equal bet. You know, heads, you win $52, tails, you lose $2. Would you take that bet? 
Yes, you would take that bet over and over and over and over again, right? So if you compare it to sort of what H could win by, well, whatever, I don't really care about that level of detail at this point, or because we don't have the guidance here, but this is the only guidance we have as to what's a substantial diminishment. It doesn't give you any analysis, but it just concludes it's not. And so uh, H can't lose significantly enough. So L can never lose, H can lose, but a little bit. And he, again, H would take this, just because you might lose doesn't mean you don't take that bet. Um, again, the heads you win 50, tails you lose two, you might lose, but you take that bet. Um, and let's just, for kicks, let's just, well, any questions about H and how H can lose? And every other permutation that you were to run, you could run 451 of tax exempt and 550 of taxable or 451 and 549. H would never lose by more than this. We've maxed out H's loss to sort of figure out what's the worst case. Questions? Uh, you have a question. Sure. So this is, so the CS, yeah, so that part two of the test, it says there has to be a strong likelihood. Um, so hypothetically, the hot, like the, the worse off that H could be is a substantial diminishment, but there's only a 10% chance of that happening. Yes. Would, so would that still pass the test? Yeah, it's a great question. So there's two things. There's, we have to say there's no, there's a, there's a strong likelihood that no partner would be substantially diminished. So you have to figure out what the likelihood of certain things are and then whether they're, if they occur, would be substantial diminishment. So you're exactly right, that it's not just um, that you could be substantially diminished if there's only a small, very tiny chance. And you mentioned 10%, nobody really knows what this is. I mean, this example is very uh, stylized. Um, and it doesn't, and it doesn't tell you, actually, it doesn't say that this is not a substantial diminishment or that this is a strong likelihood. I mean, if you, just to go a little bit far afield, you would expect if you had a range of 450 to 550, that the most likely outcome would be 500 of each, 500, and that you have these outliers. It's kind of like an IQ test, right? If you were to pick randomly someone to take an IQ test, you know, you would, most people would be around 100. Um, so if this were like a bell curve, you would have your 450 down here and your 550 here. Yeah. And you'd expect to see something like this in terms of pro probabilities. Um, and if tax exempt interest was just really low, you know, again, but to be here, this would seem to be a very unusual circumstance. Here's your like, yeah, you're like 170 IQ or whatever. It happens, but it's not very likely. So this would suggest that because we're on these edges that the likelihood is pretty small and that we're, you know, most likely gonna be around 500 of each, in which case H wouldn't lose. Uh, so it's a great question. Uh, the, the reg example doesn't talk about, again, I can't really um, test you on it. Um, because no one knows what, that, what the answer is for that. And so um, it's good to know it, but if we can just, you know, when I've tested this in the past, it's looked at some, you know, very much like example five with some different um, tax attributes, potentially a question, and I'll, here's a range of what can happen. And so you can analyze that um, and the answers are not gonna usually depend on what exactly is strong likelihood. Good question, thank you. Uh, other questions on H? Okay, and just for kicks, let's do L. We're gonna see L has a huge win here. Um, L's after tax here is 225, because L is tax exempt. We tax effect this, that's 85% of 275 is have it here.
0.85 times 275 is 233.75, which adds up to 462.5. Uh, yeah. And then here, L walks away with 90 plus, that's going to be 467.50. So that's 557.50. So there's L's big win. Oh. Okay. It does. It sounds good. You didn't catch the. Um. So uh, there's that big win right there for L. So yeah, we don't. You know, this just shows again somebody's winning here. Um, so the test so, means that nobody. I mean, everybody can't win. There has to be a partner that loses for the test to be passed. Is that what I'm understanding? There has to be the potential for a partner to substantially lose. There has to be a, you know, if the inverse of strong likelihood is a reasonable possibility, then there has to be a reasonable possibility that a partner could be worse off. And again, uh, what makes this problem work is we have this sort of tight constraint where everything's gonna be 450 to 550. As we, if we widen that, you can, you can run some numbers. And what if we make it 300 to 700 is the range? Well, then there's a lot of variability and there we're gonna see that part, both partners could probably lose. And again, the, the biggest extreme would be what if there's, what if the ranges are zero to a thousand? Well, then it's pretty easy to see somebody could lose. Because again, high bracket is basically betting that tax exempt is going to be high. Well, if tax exempt is zero, um, they've lost that bet, you know, completely. It's a complete washout. Okay. So that's example five. And the conclusion is that this allocation lacks substantial economic effect. There's just not enough, either there's, yeah, the, the example suggests that there's just not enough at risk for H, it's just 250 is not enough. Um, if 250 were enough, then you'd have to get into the question that Jacob asked, which is, okay, even you know, there's a possibility, is it high enough of a possibility? If it's remote, if this is like that bell curve, you know, basically randomly selecting, you know, two people with, uh, you know, 170 IQs out of the population, you know, that's a really, really low possibility. Um, okay. So one last thing on this. So now that we've concluded that these allocations lack substantial economic effect, they, they, they lack, they fail to the value upon, we then have to figure out how do you reallocate this is kind of tricky and counterintuitive. And this is part two of that example five. And it says, okay, well now we know they're invalid. We tested them at the time that they become part of the partnership agreement. We did our crystal ball. So what happens if in year one, the partnership actually realizes 450 of tax exempt and 550 of taxable. So this is what actually happens in year one. And under the partnership agreement, so H gets 360 of the tax exam, L gets 90, that's 550 taxable, and that goes all to L. And so if the partnership, under the partnership agreement, H's capital account would go up by 360 and L's would go down by 640. But we know that these allocations are invalid. So we have to reallocate these tax items. 
under PIP, partner's interest in the partnership. And that's a facts and circumstances test. But we had we saw one special PIP rule, um, dash one B three, three little eyes, that gave us some certainty, at least for economic effect. We also have a special PIP rule for just a pure substantiality test. And that's in this reg. The citation for this is this example, because there's no, it doesn't tell you this in the reg itself, but the example tells you what the answer is. And it's counterintuitive. Most students, when they look at this, will say, ah, it's pretty easy. We compared it to a 50-50 baseline. So let's just reallocate 50-50. We have, you know, that's the sharing ratio we compared it to to figure out whether it was valid or not. Once it's invalid, let's just bring them back to 50-50. But the right example doesn't take that approach. And it says, okay, we're not going to change the bottom line, what the capital accounts are end up at. We're going to change what it's comprised of. And so we're going to say, okay, H under the agreement, you got 360 out of a total of $1,000. So you got 36%. And L, you got 64%. So we're going to give you 36% of each item. So the reallocation, the PIP reallocation is going to give H 36%. We're going to keep the capital account the same. We're going to change what it's comprised of. So 36% of 450 is 162. 36% of 550 is 198. So this is what's going to be reported by H. And L gets 64% of 450 for the tax exempt. I had it right. 64% of 450 is 288. 64% of 550 is 352. And that adds up again to 640. So that's the reallocation. Okay, so we have one sharing ratio that we use to test whether we have substantiality satisfied. And then another another sharing ratio if it, the allocations under the agreement are insubstantial. And we're basically just gonna prorate the types of items, keeping the capital accounts the same. That's the key, we're keeping the capital. We're not gonna go to 500. Okay, and that's confusing, it's counterintuitive, but the rationale, no one really knows exactly why the tre Treasury reg writers decided to do this, but there are a couple of explanations that are potential. I mean, one is that tax is supposed to follow the economics, and so the economics, the partnership agreement tells us that this should be the capital account. That's what the partners have agreed their capital accounts will be. And so we can't really have a tax failure then redo the capital accounts. Yeah. Tax follows the economics, not this would make the economics follow the tax. That's conceptual. The second reason could be that the reg writers just said, look, H, if you're going to play this game, there's more skin in the game for you. If you're going to lose, if you lose, we're not going to just put you back to where you were, you know, for trying. Good try. Didn't work. You go back to your baseline. No, H, you're going to really screw up your deal. Not only you're going to, you know, screw up your pre-tax economic deal and you're not going to get your tax results. And so it adds a little more risk or a lot more risk to H if he plays this game and loses it's worse for him than going back to 50-50. Regardless of the rationale, it's the clear answer. 
Okay. Questions on that? It seems like this wouldn't be a favorable thing. So is this something people try to avoid and it just happens out of accident? Well, well it's bad. You're right. It's it. Well, it's, so it's tax planning, right? And so you, you know, if you were a tax planner, what you could try to do to play these games is you have to build in enough risk so that this tax thing works. And so your client would then have to agree to sufficient pre-tax risk and then understand that there's two types of, and again, it's, it's like any type of tax planning. There's a trade-off here. If you really want to get your tax result, you got to build in a decent, you know, more risk. If you don't want to build in that much risk and you still want the tax result, then you're going to have more tax risk. And so there's two types of risk here, right? And you can, you know, you can build that in. Um, but yeah, right. This is an ugly result for H. There's a question that whether how, how good the IRS is at policing this stuff. The IRS is notoriously bad at auditing partnerships, large partnerships, complex partnerships. Um, who knows what, you know, what you can get away with in that regard, but this, you know, tax planners, which is what you all would be, uh, would take into account these rules and advise your client with respect to it. And again, it's a trade-off. If you want to build in a, you know, a whole bunch of economic risk, then you can get your deal. You can get your tax result. If you don't want to build in a whole bunch of economic risk, then there's some tax risk that what the amount that it could be recharacterized. Okay, other questions? Just a oh, quick one. Yep, go what ahead. What section provides for this sort of reallocation? Sorry, I missed the- effort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there, yeah, again, you, so the general PIP rule, which is all facts and circumstances, it doesn't really help you here, but you know, if I were to provide a citation for this approach, it's 1.704-1B5 which is the example, uh, example five, which is what we were doing, but it's two little eyes. One little eyes deals with the substantiality analysis. Two little eyes then says, okay, it's a failure. How do, what do, we, how do we actually reallocate under PIP? So again, it's sort of like a C site or whatever, right? Cause it's not really telling you what to do. There's no, but it's implying that this is the right answer and seemingly it is. Um, okay, so uh, we now just have to flesh out just a couple of special rules for substantiality. So let's go back to that uh, uh, the the uh, substantiality reg, which is one point seven zero four dash one b two three little eyes. Let's go back there right now. Dash one, B2, three little eyes. Let's just deal with a couple of loose ends here. So that's our after-tax effects test. Um, then we've got our shifting test here. And we've got our transitory test here. And we've got a couple of special rules buried here. So one is this is called the five-year rule. And it basically turns off the clock for analysis beyond five years. So um, it says, look, uh, let's say you have a situation where you're going to have losses in the early years and then gains in the later years, and you're especially allocating the losses and the gains. And so it looks transitory because you're gonna have allocations, let's say in year one, and we offset in year six. 
allocations in year two, offset in year seven and the like. It just says, look, if it takes more than five years to get the offsetting allocations, you're fine. Um, and if you take a look, I'm not gonna look at it now, but just example two of that reg, of those regs in dash one D five, is an example of, of the applying the five-year rule. And it's, you know, you know, normally when you have the five years, that's a long time for a lot of stuff to happen. And so, you know, probably without this rule, if you have to wait six years, that there's enough variability and risk built in. I mean, what's the world gonna look like in six years? I mean, COVID is a really good example. Um, there's all sorts of things that can happen. And so once you build in that risk, then, you know, you have this possibility of, of partners losing and um, capital accounts being wildly different from where they would be under the base case. But even if this were a locked dead situation, like a lease, you, know, you could have like a leasing deal where, you know, with a, where you know exactly that you're gonna lose in the early years and win in the later years, you know, down to a penny because um, you got a very credit worthy tenant um, as if it takes more than five years to get those offsetting allocations you don't you basically um, are fine okay so that's one that's not as important as the next one the next special rules in the following sentence this is called the value equals basis rule value equals basis And it says, it's a, long, it's a lot of words, it's a mouthful, but it says, look, in applying the substantiality test, you should assume that any adjustments to the partnership's uh, basis is matched by economic reduction in value. Pretend that tax depreciation is real depreciation. And what this is getting at is many times there are, we have, we, if we specially allocate depreciation, we're going to also, the partners will also specially allocate the recapture gain on the sale of that property. So let's say you have a 50 50 partnership, but you allocate all the depreciation to X and you also allocate all of the gain recapture to X. It's called a chargeback. You charge back the gain recapture back to X. Well, if the property is not going down in value as fast as the tax depreciation, let's just assume it's not going down in value at all then that gain chargeback is going to make the initial depreciation allocation transitory because the depreciation will be offset by later special gain allocated gain. And this basically blesses that because it says, look, you, can, you, you have to assume, you're allowed to assume that there will be no gain chargeback because when the property value, when the property's basis is, is reduced by depreciation, pretend that that equals economic depreciation. So there's no gain inherent in the property. And again, that's kind of hard to understand without an example. So our last example will do, back to the examples, but our good friend example one, the S1B5 example one, remember we did, we've done all, we did one, one little I all the way through to 10 little eyes. And we now we're doing 11. We haven't done this one yet. And it, it basically says, this is the situation where we have A and B each contributed 40 to the partnership, the partnership price property of 80 and everything's 50, 50, except they're gonna allocate to A all the depreciation. So all depreciation to A that's one special allocation. In addition, another special allocation, we're gonna allocate all of the gain chargeback 
back to A as well. But any gain in excess of depreciation is 50-50. And so let's just draw this up. So A and B, they each contribute 40. They buy property partnership buys property for 80. Year one comes around and they're going to depreciate property by 20. They're going to allocate it to A. This allocation has economic effect. Under these facts, the big three is satisfied. So the only question is substantiality. And with substantiality, you're gonna look for offsetting allocation. You're gonna say, okay, is this allocation potentially offset by something else? Are we giving B extra deductions elsewhere? Are we giving B less gain elsewhere? And the only potential is gonna be this chargeback. And if lo and behold, the property, let's say the property is actually worth 90. Let's say the property is worth 90. If we were to sell the property for 90, we would have 30 of gain. We'd allocate 20 pursuant to the chargeback, CB chargeback. We'd allocate the remaining 10 of gain, five and five. But lo and behold, we now have offsetting. The capital accounts are in the same place. If under the baseline, we'd allocated everything 50-50, it would have looked like this. Capital accounts are gonna end up at 45 either way. So you'd have to test under transitory, under overall tax effects test, you know, you'd have to do an analysis. And you'd have to ask what's the likelihood that the property will actually drop in value But what the, the value goes basis rule does, it says for purposes of, of testing substantiality, you ignore the possibility that this could happen. There is the property for substantiality purposes, the property is deemed to be worth 60. And if it were sold for 60, then there would be no gain. And now the analysis is A's capital account is now For purpose of testing substantiality, A's capital account is going to be 20 and B's is 40, as opposed to A's being 30 and B's being 30. We're not going to, you know, we're going to ignore the possibility of the chargeback, close our eyes to it. And that means capital accounts are different. So we don't have a transitory or shifting problem. Can one partner lose? I mean, A has got a much lower capital account here than A would otherwise would be. There's just no offsetting allocation uh, that we take account of. And so this is blesses those chargebacks. So if you have situations, this is common in real estate, we have situations where you have a partner who gets a disproportionate amount of depreciation but yet there's a high degree of confidence that the property is not going to depreciate. Um, you could then allocate the chargeback back to that partner and it's not going to be a substantiality problem. And if that partner is in a high bracket, a higher bracket than the other partners, then that's a win because that partner is getting a basically a larger interest-free loan from the government. And that's fine, even if it's locked dead certainty that the chargeback is going to cover the depreciation. Uh, it's fine. This is tax planning that's been blessed by the government. Okay, so that's the value cost basis rule. And just to go back to that, let's go back to the text of that in the reg. 
the next sentence makes clear. There's a bags of basis rule there. The next sentence, thus there can be, a, cannot be a strong likelihood of the economic effect of an allocation. will largely be largely offset by the allocation of gain or loss from this position of pro partnership property. And then this cross-reference put a six little eyes is where this is shown. It's what we just showed. Okay, so that's value equals basis rule. So any questions on that? So the five-year rule, again, not as important Yeah. So right. if, if you did sell it for 90 and there was the over, so you're over the, the value, you're, you're allowed to give, I mean, charge back the, the, the deduction or not the deduction. Yeah. The deduction to a, and yeah. then split the profit. Yeah. I mean, again, I just made it 90. I mean, it's more clear if they sell it back for 80, right? I mean, I probably should have just, you know, again, to just isolate it. Let's say they sell it for 80 in year two. Let's say, you know, this is what happened. Let's say this actually happens. Say year one, this happened, they get depreciation. In year two, they actually sell it for 80. So there's 20 of gain. It's all depreciation we captured. It all goes to A. Again, under the baseline, it would have gone 10 each. So we end up here. And this looks like a classic transitory problem, right? I mean, under the transitory test, the capital accounts are in the same place and we have to see whether the total tax liability of the partners goes down. And let's say A is in a higher bracket in year one than in year two. But the value because basis rule says we don't have to worry about that. We just basically, we can ignore that this could happen. Assume it's not going to happen. And if you assume it's not going to happen, then we're back to that other situation. So it's a taxpayer friendly rule. It allows you to specially allocate the appreciation, specially allocate the, the, the chargeback, and then not have to worry about that being a substantiality failure. Okay. Um, so let's just recap on, on, on what we've done here. Again, I encourage you to play with these examples and. If you look at it now, we've gone through um, all of the examples here up to this dash 1B5. So we did example one, the entire amount, which one little i through 10 little i's is all economic effect, and then 11 little i's is, has this value basis illustration. Example two is the five year rule, which we didn't talk about, but you can see how it works. Again, don't spend too much energy on the five-year rule. Example three, we're going to come back to that when we go through these problems. So let's hold on that. Um, example four, we didn't cover, but you should be able to understand that. Um, it's not, not that important. Example five is the really good illustration of the after-tax effects test. Example six we saw was an example of the shifting test. Example seven, one little i is an example of the transitory test. Two little i is an example of the two and three or shifting test. And that's pretty much it for our purpose. Okay. All right, well, let's, um, we only have 10 minutes. Let's just start this review problem. We're gonna end up being basically one class behind on the syllabus and it's good timing because I have to update the syllabus. So um, the problems on page, I'll just have time to sort of set this up.
So here in problem one, we've got A and B each contributing 100 to a partnership. They take the 200 and they buy the building. And the building just, you know, is on lease land. So that means we allocate the entire purchase price is depreciable. We don't have to allocate some to the land and make it non-depreciable, which complicates the matter. And we have the straight line depreciation in a 10 year recovery period. Again, in this class, we're not gonna be, to keep things simple, it'll be straight line. I'll tell you what the recovery period is. And we start off and the allocations have, uh, with a big three is satisfied. Um, so it asks us, what about year one? How do we allocate the depreciation year one? The allocation, depreciation is allocated entirely to B. And everything else is 50-50. So let's just see how this works. So here's our capital accounts. A and B are each putting in 100. They buy the building for 200. Year one depreciation is 20. Again, another thing we'll do, all other income and deductions offset. So because they cancel out zero, zero, and that's a zero, everything's 50, 50. We don't have to even put in board. We just isolate that. That's a way to isolate the depreciation. So under the agreement, the year one depreciation goes to B. And we test that for substantial economic effect. It's easy. Big three is met, we have economic effect. Uh, what about substantiality? Can you look for offsetting allocations, pairs of allocations? This is just, alloc we don't have a gain charge back here. So we don't even have to even say value equals basis. All the gain is gonna be 50-50. And so we're not going to see an offsetting allocation to B. So there's no substantiality problem. So at the end of year one, the capital account, so that allocation is valid. A's capital account is 100, B's capital account is 80. The problem goes on to ask, what must the partner's retired capital accounts be? And that would be uh, the capital accounts, 100 to A and 80 to B. What if they sell the building in year two? What if they sell the building for 180 in year two? Well, if they sell it for 180 in year two, there's no gain. The book value is 180. So there's no amount realized is 180. So there's no gain, nothing to allocate. And then if they were to liquidate, say liquidate according to positive capital account balances, A would get 100, and B would get 80. And that reflects how B is going to suffer economically that depreciation that A gets. What if they sold it for 200? Well, now the amount realized would be 180. The book value is, I'm sorry, not realize it's 200. The book value is 180, to be 20 of gain. How is that allocated? Well, under the agreement, if everything else is 50-50, it'd be allocated 110, what 10 and 10? And A's capital account would be 110, and B's capital account would be 90. And the 200 of proceeds would be distributed 110 and 90. And that's kind of bizarre economically, because if you think about it, you know, the partnership starts with 200, ends with 200, and we end up with this weird thing where A gets $10 more than he put in and B gets $90 more, uh, $10 less. That's kind of weird. So the last thing we'll do is what if there's a chargeback? So now, same facts, except 
we're going to specially allocate the depreciation to A, and we're going to specially allocate the gain chargeback to A, to, I'm sorry, to B. So if we had a gain chargeback, then all 20 of this gain here ref, re, reflects depreciation recapture. It all goes back to B. That's our gain chargeback. And then we go 100 and 100. The 200 proceeds will be distributed there and there. And again, that raises the question, at least conceptually, well, we have an offsetting allocation. Does that create ring a bell, arm be an alarm bell is ringing, the okay, you know, offsetting allocations, do we have to worry about substantiality? And again, the answer to that is no. The Baticus basis rule tells us we basically get to ignore the prospect of a chargeback. Again, we're testing this, whether this is valid and determining whether that's valid, we get to close our eyes to the fact that there's a chargeback. We don't have to worry, well, does the building actually go down in value? How much? We're told to assume irrebuttably that that building is now worth 180 at the end of year one. And so there won't be a chargeback. Because there's no chargeback, then V you know, suffers economically. Capital counts are different than they would have been. Again, the base case would have looked like this. They would have got 10 of each and then 10. So that the chargeback is not going to be a substantiality problem because of value plus basis. So that's when we get here, this. I'm sorry, actually C, this is the chargeback. So again, with the chargeback, the allocation is valid regardless of the chargeback because of the basis and it's the same answer as in B when we sold it for 200. And that's again, whether the chargeback, you know, you can run the spreadsheet and you can say we, you know, have a 99% certainty that this property is not going to go down in value. Doesn't matter, it's still okay. Um, okay, questions on that? All right, so next class, we won't get beyond this problem, I don't think. Next class, so on Monday, we'll finish this review problem. And in D, E and F, um, D, E, F, and G are all like alternate effect tests. So we'll do alternate effect test. C and D, uh, two and three are all substantiality. So again, one last really good chance to, to firm up our knowledge on the ec alternate economic effect test and the substantiality. And then we move on on Wednesday and I'll update the syllabus accordingly. Okay, any questions? All right. Uh, so have a good weekend. Let me know if there's any questions via email.